Well, hello, welcome back to Intermediate Writing or Intermediate Composition. Hope you all had a good holiday. Uh, I've given you a couple of assignments and one of the topics I will talk about today, process paragraphs and uh, cause and effect paragraphs. And I was going to give you an assignment about that, but I decided not to because of the holiday. So I'm just going to talk through that. I'm just going to talk through some points about process and cause and effect paragraphs today and kind of set up the next assignment for you. And the next time we will talk about introduction paragraphs. All right, so uh, you should look at uh, two sample uh, writings in the book. Um, the first one is uh, Principles of Poor Writing. And let's see, that is on page 45 in the book. And then the next one, which is uh, a little essay about uh, happiness. Does trying to be happy make us unhappy by Adam Grant. So let's look at the first one. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at a couple of process um, cause and effect paragraphs. And really these two types or genres of paragraphs are very similar. So I'm going to kind of put them together. Um, you've probably done them before in a writing class. So I'm only going to focus on some of the uh, grammatical forms and uh, the distinctions between formal and informal style in these paragraphs and some of the interesting points. So let's look at the first one, uh, poor writing, the little essay about poor writing, how to write poor essay. Um, what are some of the steps in the process that the writer talks about? Uh, if you want to write a poor essay, a bad essay, a poor writing assignment, well, you ignore, you ignore the readers. Maybe you explain your main points, your main ideas in a way that makes sense to you, but you don't consider what will make sense to the reader. And unfortunately, one of the best things to overcome that is something we can't really do this semester in a uh, whether it's a recorded lecture-based semester or a Zoom semester or any kind of online course, one of the best things to do for that is to have you physically in my classroom. You trade papers and you do what's called peer editing. You trade papers and you give each other feedback. And that's when you realize, oh, this is clear to me, but I see all oh, these arguments or the way I've developed my ideas. The contents are not clear to someone else. So it's always good to maybe get into a study group. By all means, form a study group with friends, with classmates. And when you have a major assignment, um, trade your drafts, bring your essay drafts, trade them with each other, give each other feedback. Uh, a study group is the next best thing. Uh, best thing is to do peer editing in class. The next best thing is to do a study group where you help each other with your paper assignments. Uh, otherwise, your explanations might be ineffective. It might make the logic, um, like the main, main thesis and the main points in the body and the kind of support and evidence and arguments you give for your points might be clear to you, but they might not be clear to someone else. Uh, having feedback from another person can help you to see what things you need to do to make your ideas clearer. So one of the first points this writer talks about is ineffective, poor explanations for the reader. Lack of connectives, lead out, connectives are things like since, however, but, and, thus, therefore, whereas, as a result, in uh, such things. Um, and we talked before about uh, the other problem, the opposite problem, which is overusing too many common connectives, overusing but, and, so, instead of but, use a variety, uh, however, whereas, maybe, on the contrary, in contrast, to the contrary, uh, things like that. Informal or excessive emphasis. So, for example, using quotation marks. I think this writer maybe talked about some other things, but uh, overuse of emphasis in your paper, trying to put emphasis on everything. And what I see, for example, is writers, student writers, overusing maybe things like bold face print, bold font, underlining, quotation marks to highlight important ideas. 
that's a very informal style. That's like in speaking, I put my, raise my voice to put emphasis on something. And well, in writing, it's kind of like you're shouting at the reader. Uh, it's like you're typing an email and you're typing in all capitals. That's kind of, you know, before modern email, old, old email, old style email. Uh, when we couldn't do those text formatting things, we typed in all capital letters to emphasize things, but it was poor form because it's like shouting at the reader. Overuse of emphasis, italic font, boldface to emphasize keywords, and also using quotation marks to highlight new words or technical words, keywords. Um, that's kind of like textbook style where in textbooks they might use italics, boldface, maybe quotation marks to highlight keywords. If it's very textbook style or it's informal style. And in academic essays, we don't really do that um, very much. Occasionally, yes, when we need to define a certain term in a very unique way, like this term has a very special use in this particular area. But otherwise, don't use that for emphasis. Uh, that's not to be used for emphasis. Uh, verbosity, that is wordiness, sometimes being very wordy. And this essay gives examples of being too wordy, verbosity, verbose. Deadwood, throwing in a lot of unnecessary words to uh, unnecessary words to impress the reader or to increase the word count of your essay. What this writer calls deadwood. It's kind of like dead wood, dead trees that are maybe floating down the river uh, or whatever. It serves no purpose. Dead wood. Using a lot of fancy expressions, uh, maybe just to impress the reader. And maybe they're expressions you're not sure about and you just throw them in there. You, you did a Google search and you found some impressive sounding academic words, but they're words that you don't usually use and you just throw them in your essay. It's showing off. A fancy or formal term for this is ostentation, showing off, being showy. Or a slang term for this is bling, 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 the heavy gold jewelry that hip hop singers wear to show off how wealthy they are. In slang, that's called bling, bling. So putting a bunch of bling into your essay, uh, the excessive wordiness, uh, throwing in a lot of fancy words to show off, or maybe a lot of references, a lot of source citations, but they're things you didn't actually read. You're just putting in references to show off. A wording that's vague. Informal examples. So we uh, see in this essay, for example, the writer uses um, things like a table. Uh, he highlights his examples with a table showing different examples of uh, to compare maybe okay and good writing with bad writing uses a table and that's kind of informal uh, style. There are times when tables are appropriate when you have data information, but if it's just text like this, uh, overusing tables may not be good. Uh, some people overuse bullet, bullet lists. Bullet lists are informal and they are fine in some places, but not so much in a college essay. We don't usually use bullets, bullet point lists in college essays. Anecdotal examples. An anecdote is like a personal story. This is what happened to me, or this is what happened to my best friend. Uh, informal examples like that, uh, anecdotes, anecdotal stories, um, they don't have really uh, credibility. They don't have much credibility for an educated reader. Uh, we'll see later that there are some kinds of examples, real life examples that are okay, uh, but just your own personal example uh, or your friend's example, what happened to your brother or sister, uh, it's not, uh, outside of maybe uh, a first year intro essay, in, you know, first year college class, outside of that, you know, anecdotal examples are not really good. You, you want documented examples from a good source, from a uh, examples that are kind of collected and interpreted by a researcher and published somewhere or data or some kind of hard information. The last thing this writer talks about is not revising your paper, not going through and revising it. I want to ask you if you're guilty of any of these. Uh, a lot of college writers have trouble with some of these points, including 
native speakers. The tone and style. Let me point out the tone and style. This is a very informal essay. And so the writer is deliberately writing an example of a bad essay. It's bad in, in some ways. He's using a very informal style. It's a demonstration. Uh, the essay itself is kind of a demonstration by example of things not to do. The informal style. Sarcasm and humor. I love sarcasm and humor, and it's fine for an informal essay. If this were to be a formal essay, it would not work. Uh, he, this writer is deliberately writing an informal essay in conversational style with sarcasm and humor. Informal vocabulary, a lot of informal vocabulary, including first or second person expressions, a lot of commands, do this, do that. I mentioned before, it's informal. And use of again, things like using italics or boldface or quotation marks for emphasizing words, expressions, ideas. Uh, you don't do that. Uh, except maybe when he is citing examples of connectors that are often left out or omitted in poor essays. Okay, that's okay. It's a, citing a linguistic example. Uh, but otherwise, just using italics or quotes to highlight technical terms, new words, or just for emphasis everywhere, not good. Uh, next, let's look at the essay on page 49, Does Trying to Be Happy Make Us Unhappy? by Adam Grant. Now, this is uh, a professor in management, so he has probably some background in psychology, more so business psychology, the psychology of like workplace, workplace psychology, uh, what we call industrial and organizational psychology. That's actually a branch of psychology. So some people in business departments who are interested in like workplace issues, they probably may have studied industrial organizational psychology. Um, that includes the psychology of like groups and people working together and happiness and, and related issues. Uh, let's look at the style and tone. It's a little bit more, slightly more formal, but it's still fairly informal. Um, some first and second person um, from the beginning as we muddle through our days. Uh, so there's some first or second person, maybe not so much second person in this case. There's a mix of formal and informal vocabulary. There's some good words in here like ruminate. Ruminate literally refers to cows, you know, cows to their food the first time they swallow it goes to one stomach then they actually kind of bring it back up and they chew it again so chewing your food again that's ruminating or in psychology ruminating is like you mentally you're going over something in your mind you keep going over it over and over in your mind you're ruminating on it maybe you're angry at about something that happened and that goes over you play it in your mind over and over and over and over that's ruminating uh, it might be about something good, but most often we talk about ruminating over something you know, we talk about it in a negative way. You can't fall asleep at night because your mind is ruminating over, you know, what happened during the day or ruminating about something that has made you upset in the past day or week or month. Uh, so there's some, uh, a mix of formal and informal vocabulary here. Uh, there are, I think, a couple of, one or two anecdotal examples, but they're documented. Um, they're not his own personal examples, but he got them from another researcher, uh, another uh, psychologist who actually documented and interpreted this case. So this is a psychologist who actually documented a case study. It's an actual published case study, I think, uh, by a psychologist who treated a patient and the psychologist is writing about her patient, Tom, for example, uh, in the second paragraph, uh, and this is a, a case that a psychologist has documented and interpreted. The psychologist is giving her uh, interpretation. Um, so it's a professional example by a professional who's qualified to discuss this kind of case, Tom's case. Uh, as such, it's, he, he, he's not maybe a research psychologist. This writer is more of a business psychologist, and he's talking about more of a general topic. So this has some pop psychology in here, kind of more popular psychology. It's not so much heavy real research psychology, 
but it's called, he's trying to make this kind of more practical, maybe oversimplifying some things. Uh, maybe not everything is entirely accurate in doing so. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but it's got some generally good advice in here. He tries to correct some misconceptions that a lot of people have about happiness. Correcting misconceptions, that's pretty good. Uh, and giving some advice, and I think it's it's good advice. One of the main strengths of this paper is it gives some good advice. It has some good advice for all of us about happiness in life. Now, weaknesses. Uh, I think that one case study is not enough, and he spends a long time talking about one case study. It's a bit long. That could be more concise, shorter, and uh, either another example or even better, some data, some hard data. So not just a case study, uh, but just some actual data, like oh, how many people in the society have some misconception about happiness, or according to statistics, you know, you know what percent of the population is seeking happiness this way or that way. Uh, some hard data here. He also talks about flow. He, he, he quotes a, a famous psychologist who, whose name is hard, kind of hard to say. Uh, it's in the middle, page 50. Uh, psych, he's a famous psychologist. His name is Csikszentmihalyi. It's hard to say. Um, let's call him C. Uh, who talks about flow. And uh, I, I think that this part is not really so relevant to the overall essay. The overall essay is about happiness and life satisfaction. And he talks about flow, and flow is really, uh, it's a special psychology term. Uh, when you're really involved in something, like you're, you know, you're playing the piano, or you're playing tennis, and you're so involved mentally in what you're doing, you lose track of time. You're, uh, you're really so into it that you, your brain tunes out everything else that's happening around you, and you're just lost in the moment, and you don't even sense the passage in t of time. You're, you're so into an event, you're so absorbed into something that you're doing or something that's happening. I don't think that's really relevant to an essay that's really about life happiness and life satisfaction because flow is a very special thing that happens in a moment. And I don't think that's really relevant here. So that's maybe one major weakness of this essay. Uh, I think this makes some good points and I'm going to actually come back to some of those points later in this lecture. Uh, let's think about some of the uh, grammatical forms in these process, cause, and effect kinds of essays and paragraphs. Um, probably you would expect to see modal verbs sometimes, should, would, like happiness should not be sought, seek, sought directly, but should be sought after indirectly. That's kind of a point that this essay is making. If you seek happiness itself, if you're trying to find happiness, you won't find it. If you try to do other things that you enjoy in life, what brings you joy and satisfaction in life, if you seek that, then you maybe find happiness indirectly by seeking something else. You can't seek happiness directly, but it is to be sought. So happiness should not be sought directly. So as a should, you could do that. It might be a bit strong, so be careful about using this in an academic essay, but is to be sought. This is kind of more descriptive it's kind of a uh, what is to be done, what should be done, uh, what can be done, is to be sought after indirectly. So that is to be, it's sort of like a modal is to be. Uh, it's a bit like a modal, a bit like should or would. And it's more formal in style, is to be. Now, I don't really see examples here in these essays in a very, very formal context. You could use the pronoun one. One is a very generic pronoun, and it sounds very formal. Often when you're talking about advice or uh, what should be done, what is to be done, um, but don't overuse it because it may sound over formal, overly formal. Uh, for example, you could say, one uses long sentences whenever possible to impress the reader. So it's a very neutral, generic pronoun one uses uh, for a general description or maybe for advice or suggestion. Um, you see this in very formal contexts. We don't see it in these essay examples. Uh, of course, you're going to see connectors, logical connectors that are appropriate for these kinds of paragraphs, if, whether, then, as a result, hence, thus, therefore. Uh, some of those are probably here. 
One note about whether, um, the expression whether or not is informal. And in formal writing, we would just say whether. We don't know whether or not this will succeed. That's more informal. Formally, we can just say we don't know whether this will succeed. The or not is kind of redundant in formal writing. Uh, not overusing enumerative markers. There's not much. So those are things like first, second, third, or the British firstly, secondly, thirdly. There's not much of that in these essays. A little bit, uh, but not much. Uh, enumerative markers, first, second, third. Don't overuse those. Uh, they're only used if you really need to make things clear uh, to readers. Um, tenses. What are some of the verb tenses we see in these paragraphs and essays? Well, there's a lot of simple past and past progressive verbs. Um, simple past, the more value people placed on happiness, the less happy they became. Simple past. Uh, maybe discussing a process ongoing in the past. Uh, when people were explicitly searching for happiness, they experienced less joy. So there's a mix of pro past progressive and simple past. Uh, narratives like the simple past in the case study of Tom's efforts to find happiness. A lot of pa simple past verbs. Uh, general present for general, uh, general statements. So in the exercise we talked about last week, the domestic plug consists of two sections, general statements. Uh, the world is divided into two camps. Um, sometimes when you're talking about ideas or theories, you use the simple present. Um, see, the psychologist, see, uh, or uh, what's this guy's name? Uh, six cents, min, hali, whatever. Okay, see, finds that when people are in a flow state, they don't report being happy as they are too busy concentrating on the activity or conversation. So, see, finds. So, general statements about ideas. Um, theories and such general uh, statements of truth. Uh, participles and gerunds are, are, of course, sometimes used in these kinds of process paragraphs, cause and effect paragraphs. Um, don't have time um, to talk right now about gerunds and participles. Perhaps later on I might do something on that. Um, other general statements, when we want to be happy, we look for strong positive emotions like joy and such. Unfortunately, research shows that this isn't the best path. Uh, narrative present, sometimes, sometimes the present tense is used for kind of narration, a, a lifelike narration. T uh, Tim, or Tom, reports being happy in this case study. And the perfect tense, or what some teachers might call the present perfect, linguists just call it the perfect tense. Uh, once you've landed, once you have landed, a gold medal. Once you have gained, landed a gold medal, or won the lottery. Once you have landed a gold medal, or once you have won the lottery. That's perfect tense. So the perfect tense is sometimes used in such paragraphs and often mixed with other verb tenses as appropriate. The perfect tense indicates two things. Recency, it's relatively recent, and it's relevant to the present state or situation. It has these two flavors. So one or both of these is important when we use a present a perfect tense verb. So um, here in this statement, once you've landed a gold medal or have won the lottery, as a result, it's relevant to the fact that it's hard. It's hard to take pleasure in finding a great parking spot or winning a video game. Uh, relevance. Another example, a more informal example, you ask your friend, hey, why are you crying? And the person says, my girlfriend has broken up with me. My boyfriend has broken up with me. So it's, it feels recent to that person and it has, it's relevant to their current state. They're sad, they're crying, they're depressed. Recency, relevance. Uh, it would be different if they said, oh, um, my girlfriend or boyfriend broke up with me a month ago, but now I feel fine. I'm glad we weren't really suitable for each other and I'm happy and I moved on. I have moved on, meaning I have moved on, I'm better now. Uh, so it's kind of relative to the situation. Has broken up with me because it hurts right now. Broke up with me in the past, I'm over it, it's fine, it's history. 
Uh, you see this sometimes in news context. Merkel has announced, the leader of the Chancellor of Germany, Merkel has announced, has announced that she is stepping down as leader of the, her party and thus uh, from her office. Uh, and that makes sense. Now, it would be really strange to use that for something in the past like prehistoric key people have invented the wheel. Uh, that's not news, that's not recent. It doesn't feel relevant or recent at all. That would be really weird. You wouldn't really talk like that unless you're a time traveler. <clears throat> Some more examples, a bit more academic examples. We have found that first year college students at this university lack motivation toward learning English. Uh, if I did a study and I'm, I, I've just done this, I've just done my analysis, this is what I've just found and I'm talking about this at a conference, or I'm writing a paper about it, I would say, we have found. Now, if it's research I did a year ago, and I'm talking about it because it's relevant to some uh, uh, different research I did you know, recently, this is more in the past, we would use simple past. We found that, da da da, and so we did some more study. Uh, so we have found, it's something recent and it's relevant because I'm talking about this research right now, this analysis, this data right now that I've just analyzed. No study has looked at this satisfactorily. So this research project uh, will examine this. So here I'm using the perfect tense to kind of give a rationale for the main clause, the main idea. We will examine this problem. Why? Because no study has looked at this problem satisfactorily. Uh, or um, past studies have found that students prefer native English speaking, but they fail to consider other options. So past studies, we just looked at some past studies, we just talked about some, uh, but so they have reported this because they're fairly recent and it's relevant to what I'm talking about, what I'm going to do. They fail to consider other options, which I'm going to look at in my paper now. Uh, some more informal examples. I have found that chocolate is not necessary for happiness. Relevant because now I'm losing weight because uh, I've cut down on my chocolate eating. So now I'm losing weight. I thought that money would make me happy, but I found happiness. It's a recency. I found happiness by living in the moment. Relevance. Now I'm living in the moment. I'm happier now. I thought a relationship would make me happy, but I found happiness. Same thing. Recency and relevance. I found happiness as a single person. Uh, so this gets back to some of the themes of the essay that uh, I, I hope that you read. The writer talks about happiness, and he makes some really great points. Um, if you seek happiness, you're not going to find it. Uh, and I would say the same is true for some other key, key things in life. Uh, some of us maybe are focus, focused on seeking happiness. I want to be happy in life. The thing is, you're not... Let's do some conditional and modal phrases. If you seek happiness, you won't find it. If you seek happiness directly, you won't find it. If you seek meaning in life, so maybe some of you are focused on, well, what's the meaning of my life? Well, if you seek meaning itself, you may not find it. Instead, you seek those other things that bring you joy, that bring you happiness, that bring you meaning, and pursue those. Don't pursue happiness itself or more formally, I would say uh, those things are not to be sought directly or you don't, would not want to seek those or should not seek those directly but indirectly. Uh, so this is good advice. The same thing is true for like relationships. Maybe you're lonely and you think, oh, if I just found the right person, that would make me happy. Uh, not true. It's actually not true. That's a big misconception. Uh, just like as this essay points out that seeking happiness directly uh, is not going to make you happy. Um, it, it's like something you, you cannot seek directly. Um, finding like your deepest emotional needs, uh, it's not something you seek directly. Uh, so a lot of young people might think, oh, if I just found the right uh, man or woman, uh, I won't be lonely anymore and I'll be happy if I could just find the right person and marry that person, be with that person forever. Uh, the problem is another person, you know, after the, like, the emotional highs of a relationship and you've been married a few years, you get tired of each other and you realize this person doesn't make me happy. Another person doesn't make you happy. 
Uh, it might give you like a temporary emotional high for a few months or for a while. But after you get back to kind of normal life, you realize this person doesn't make me happy. You don't find um, relationship satisfaction by seeking relationship satisfaction, or you don't find love by seeking love directly, um, or a cure to loneliness by seeking a person. Because uh, it doesn't work that way. That's not how the human mind, human mind works. We don't find happiness or uh, an end to loneliness by seeking that directly, but indirectly. Uh, if you are lonely and you're thinking, oh, if you're really desperately seeking another person to end your loneliness, your body language is broadcasting signals to other people that says, I'm lonely, I'm lonely, I'm desperate. And you're going to attract one of two people. One, you're going to attract maybe a bad person who is going to see your weakness and take advantage of you. Uh, and uh, after uh, a few months or years, you realize this is a bad person. They're using you, they're taking advantage of you, misusing you uh, in a bad way. You're going to attract a bad person who's going to misuse or even abuse you. Uh, that's one danger. The other danger, not as bad perhaps, but still quite depressing, you're going to attract another person who's also lonely and you want that person to meet your needs and he or she wants you to meet their needs in a way that's not humanly possible. That's just not how humans work. Um, instead, you have to learn to be happy as a single person, to be self-fulfilled, self to find your own happiness and meaning in life, to show confidence. If you are confident and happy as a single person, you're going to attract another person, probably, who is confident and happy as a single person, and you're going to be happier together you know, if you do marry each other. Uh, or enter a long-term relationship. Uh, so I think this essay has great advice uh, for us. That's why I included it. Uh, and uh, allows us to use, you know, modals and conditionals, conditionals like if, and modals, would, should, and things like that. So that's another reason I picked that. Uh, so in this lecture, we've kind of seen some of the techniques, some of the especially grammatical forms of process and cause and effect paragraphs. And I kind of really put them two together because they're really similar. I'm not going to distinguish them. They're very similar. Uh, and this all kind of relates to your upcoming assignment at Google Form. Uh, and this is preparing you for the midterm. So more information later on the midterm. But the Google Form asks you to, well, explain maybe in a, a few sentences. Well, tell me about your pursuit of happiness. How are you seeking happiness in life or improving yourself? How are you improving yourself? Probably in your college years, maybe this is a time where you probably are thinking about how to improve yourself or you would want to do so anyway because you're entering the adult world. You've got to think about getting a job and maybe getting married. I'm not saying you should. Um, only get married if you really feel like that's for you, if you want to. Uh, not everyone has to get married and all that. Some people are not really for, you know, it's not their thing and that's cool. Uh, and I also want you to think about your qualities, your talents, and your abilities. So kind of, we talked about classification paragraphs earlier. So I want you to kind of classify your talents or abilities or personal qualities, especially those that would be relevant for you as an, an adult, if you're going on for graduate school, if you're applying for a job and you, okay, what are, what are um, qualities, talents, abilities that you have that you would talk about, kind of classify them somehow in terms of maybe the most relevant for the job or some other kind of way of classifying them. Uh, and all of this is going to prepare you for some upcoming assignments, including the midterm uh, and others. Uh, kind of more self-analysis here, self-awareness. So that's it for now. Uh, as I mentioned, next time we're going to talk about introductory paragraphs. So look at that section in the book. And good luck with your assignments. Enjoy your homework and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.